Good evening. Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Martin Clunes. And in the news this week, at rehearsals for the London 2012 opening ceremony, organisers admit it was a mistake to let Boris Johnson have first go at running with the Olympic torch. <laughs> at Covent Garden, a reporter announces that celebrities who will be turning on this year's Christmas lights will be Jedward. In Dublin, there's delight at the news that the EU has finally outlawed national stereotyping. <laughs> After 60 years in show business, publishers scramble to buy the rights to Ronnie Corbett's diaries. <laughs> and in Wigan, a councillor proudly announces that the council's anti-litter scheme has been a total success. As a result, it does take quite a long time to make change, even with the best will in the world. <laughs> with Ian is an actress who recently said that British comedy is still patronising and sexist and women can't be trusted to be funny. Uh, listen, love. <laughs> All you need there is a punchline, all right? <laughs> Please welcome the gorgeous Rebecca Front. And with Paul is a stand-up comedian who, in 2008, received £8,000 for winning the Intelligent Finance Comedy Award and promptly invested the lot in Greek bonds. Please welcome <laughs> David O'Doherty. <laughs> and we start with the bigger stories of the week. Paul and David, take a look at this. Oh, this is uh, uh, North Korea, obviously. This is uh, the, the, the leader there who... Oh, that, that was an airtight box. He was all right before they put me in there. <laughs> um, Kim Jong, very ill. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, so, he, yes, and that's his son there who parts his hair in an extraordinary way that no other person ever does, which bodes ill for the uh, Korean people. So, yes, it's uh, the old bloke's dead and new blokes come in. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And do you know where Kim Where do those glasses come from? <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> I didn't know it was fancy dress. <laughs> <laughs> The women that were weeping at the escalator was quite amusing, wasn't it? Because he'd sort of, he'd travelled on an escalator, one of his last public appearances was visiting this department store, and they're now weeping and treating the escalator as a shrine, a moving shrine, well, literally. Would you like to see the last photograph taken of him? Oh, yes, please. While yes. he was alive. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Looking a bit Romery. <laughs> um, <laughs> the escalator has now become a shrine. Yeah. So look, there's people surrounding the escalator. Nicely. <laughs> Well, maybe they're just worried that the escalator's broken down. <laughs> <laughs> it's competitive grief, isn't it? Competitive grief? Yeah, you Grieving. cry really loud, you get a house. <laughs> if you don't cry loud enough, or you don't, you're not seen to be crying, you get killed. Yeah. Which is a Be given something enough. to cry about, I believe. Yeah. Mm. Very much the way I bring up my children. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite fascinated by Kim Jong-un, Kim Young-un. Is he the new one? Yeah, he's the new yeah. one. Because, he, he, you know, he's, he's quite a... He's a portly chap. Yeah. I'm yeah. a little despot, short and stout. Yeah. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you look at him, and I mean, I wouldn't normally comment on somebody's people's appearance. On, yeah. Well, not on a man's girth. Well, I might, but I mean, I <laughs> do <laughs> <laughs> it on a show like this, obviously. Um, <laughs> you've, you've got to say, if the rest of the population is starving, he isn't. <laughs> and do you know what his first official duty was? Change a national anthem. Uh, no, attend his father's uh, lying in state. It was eerily reminiscent of Jimmy Savile's recent. <laughs> Only without the little ashtray full of cigar butts, but in every other way. And it wasn't in a pub, but in every other way. <laughs> no, it's very dangerous being a Kim, because it? it's all purpose. You know, one Kim's dead, long live the next Kim. Yeah. Um, and his, well, another of the brothers was deemed too effeminate. Anyway, he was, he was chucked, and this is the best you can get from that family. And he's the youngest, isn't he? Is that right? Is he...? The youngest still alive. Ah, uh, yeah, that could be Kim Jong Un. That would make him the youngest. Kim Jong Un, I think. <laughs> but he's got a sister as well. I can't remember her name. I think it's Kim. Is yeah. It Kim? <laughs> you know what the mother's name was? <laughs> Kim. <laughs> Kim, okay. <laughs> like the shampoo. <laughs> um, Kim Jong Il was known as the dear leader, latterly, but he accumulated quite a number of other names. Do you remember any of those? His father was called the Eternal President. 
Because even after he was dead, he was still president. Was he? Yeah, he still dead is. body. Is he still? I think he still is. I may have just got that wrong. Well, no, 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 that's eternity for you. He <laughs> just he, <laughs> keeps on coming. He was also known as the uh, glorious general who descended from heaven. Yeah. Amazing politician. Yes. <laughs> and uh, eternal bosom of hot love. <laughs> Uh, according to the official state version of events, what happened around the time of his birth? Uh, there was a star in the east. <laughs> Pretty much. It was foretold by uh, a swallow. Unusual. A swallow? Yes. <laughs> Nothing to do with the conception. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> a, a double... <laughs> Shut up. Come on, it's Christmas. Um, it was a, a double rainbow and a new star appeared above the mountaintop where he was born. Yeah, it's nice. nice, it's nice. So only one star, though. You know, three stars would have been better, five stars the best. <laughs> <laughs> Did he not play a round of golf once and got 11 holes in one, is mm -hmm. that right? Yep. <laughs> Which is quite nicely detailed that he didn't go for the full... What's the full? I don't know what the full one is. 18. 18, 18 thank you. Because that wouldn't have been um, credible. Yes, Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which food did he claim to have invented in, in 2000? The banana. <laughs> The Snickers. Yeah. No, the uh, Kumquat. Not far off. Named the the Kimquat. Ah, oh, very good. Very good. It's the Goggy Upper Bang. Oh, I uh, love those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which means uh, two breads with meat, or as we would call it, a hamburger. <laughs> He, he kidnapped a filmmaker. They made him make films for him. Um, <laughs> when they first met, he said, uh, What do you think of my physique? Small as a midget's turd, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what, according to the official North Korean website, what he never ever did? Never did anything bad ever. Quite. He never defecated or urinated. Really? Yep. Yep. Don't explain the size of his son, anyway. <laughs> And what can North Korea threaten everyone with this Christmas? Armageddon. Yes, according to The Guardian, in North Korea there are a large number of no-dongs. <laughs> Not as many as in Thailand, so I've heard. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, no-dong is the name of a missile uh, which could be used to deliver a nuclear warhead. Isn't that nice? Are we within range? So, uh, yeah, I'm sure we are. Oh. We usually are. Um, <laughs> the, the Sun tracked down a Korean expert from Leeds University who said, the frightening thing is that literally anything can happen. We know nothing about Kim Jong-un and he knows nothing about anything. <laughs> and on the subject of tyrants, which despot launched his own fashion label this week? Robert Mugabe. Yes. Is it right? <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a range of T-shirts, jackets and caps, all bearing his signature under the slogan, style, comfort and a splash of attitude. <laughs> a splash of attitude. <laughs> Misprint yeah. for blood. Um, in a week when North Korea dominated the front pages, we shouldn't forget that Vaclav Havel, sadly, uh, died, the former president of the Czech Republic. The world's media were quick to pay tribute. See if you can um, spot the subliminal message in John Simpson's report here. There was nothing grand about him. He felt completely out of place with all the pomp and ceremony. He didn't even like wearing a suit. In terms of intellect, he was way ahead of most other political leaders. <laughs> yes, this is the death of Kim Jong-il. Amongst his many surprising foibles, Kim Jong-il was a huge fan of Elvis Presley. He particularly liked Hound Dog which he would often tuck into whilst listening to Elvis's greatest hits. <laughs> in his first ever game of golf, the dear leader claimed to have completed the first course in 38 under par, including 11 holes in one, thereby breaking Tiger Woods' record of being the biggest liar ever to set foot on a golf course. <laughs> Kim Jong-il's death was particularly bad news for Bono, who is now the world's only short-ass megalomaniac who wears sunglasses all the time. <laughs> There are fears that Kim Jong-il's death will leave North Korea with a power vacuum, which, if true, could be the only electrical appliance in the whole country. <laughs> Ian and Rebecca, take a look at this. Oh, that's, um, oh, right. people having cosy lunch with each other. It's, it's the rich what gets the pleasure and the poor what gets the blame. Um, Goldman Sachs, the vampire squids. And the tax dodgers. <laughs> Good, we can read. Yeah. <laughs> it's about these, are they called sweetheart deals? Um, where you take the tax person, uh, Dave Hartnett or, you know, similar, 
out to but lunch. But mostly him. But mostly him. <laughs> Take him out for lunch if you can't pay your few billion pounds worth of tax and let's face it you know times are tough um, so you just take them out for lunch and it's all fine and you and actually you can probably write most of that off and I don't want to crow but this is a private eye story which after a year has finally come good and hooray thank you very much yeah. <laughs> This is it's essentially we're all in it together except the very large companies who don't seem to have to pay their tax bills. You take out the head of the, the revenue for lunch and you get a special deal. So Vodafone, I mean, owe about £6 billion. And Goldman Sachs, one of the great financial institutions in the world, they owed a tax bill and, the, and they took him out to lunch and then he said, well, you don't have to pay any interest on this and you don't have to pay the bill for years. So it's essentially the big companies get away with a sweetheart deal, everyone else has to pay up. And, you know, when... You know, we're talking about a hole in the, the budget of 12 billion quid. Six billion's quite a lot. Well, the overall shortfall, they think, is about 25 billion. That's, 25 billion which is, in uncollected so, tax. So then yeah. we're laughing then, aren't we? Surely we just get that back and we're all all right. Yeah, we lend it to Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Ireland, please. <laughs> No, so that's the deal, and uh, the Public Accounts Committee finally looked into it after about a year and a half of everyone going, um, perhaps you should have a look. And those protesters there, they occupied Fortnum's. For hours you couldn't buy a hamper. It was murder. No, <laughs> uh, nightmare. <laughs> yes, uh, David Hartnett, the chief executive of the HMRC. He had 107 <laughs> dinners with various companies and their tax lawyers over two years. An HMRC spokesman said, in many cases, when HMRC has looked at the full facts, <laughs> It becomes clear that there's no liability. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, have you noticed how the Lib Dems have been flexing their muscles in the news lately? Well, Nick Clegg's been rude about the Prime Minister. Yes, he has. What did he do? He said Cameron's view of the family is, is stuck in the 1950s. As if we should not take a particular version of the family institution, such as the 1950s model of the suit-wearing, bread-winning dad and aproned, home-making mother, and try to preserve it in aspic. Presumably he means this sort of thing. <laughs> Nick Clegg uh, thinks we should be open to more unconventional families like this one. <laughs> <laughs> Photos like that often accompanied by words before turning the gun on himself. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem with Ed Miliband? According to Peter Mandelson. Too many jokes, although I hadn't noticed them myself, but uh, too, too, too much of a light-hearted approach, I think. Oh, you missed the joke. Did I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I, is it? He, he was in Parliament and he said, uh, Clegg and Cameron, you two... I have to get this right now. He said, <laughs> you two are like a married couple. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a messer. <laughs> I didn't realise he had such good there. material. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this yeah. person yeah. an embarrassment to the Tories? He's a Tory MP. It's one of those things where initially they say it was taken out of context. <laughs> 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 like the original context was the Second World War, so you might, not, <laughs> you might not understand what it means now. I mean, he's not the MP. He's not, no, he's no. Mark Fournier. He was the, the groom at his own uh, stag night, but the, uh, the MP was... Um... He organised the uniform, though, I believe. Oh, yeah, he paid for the costume. Did he? Yeah. And it was incredibly embarrassing, because, you know, everyone else had dressed as Tories. <laughs> 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 there was, at one point, a toast to the Third Reich, and uh, Aidan Burley has recently apologised. Uh, Do you know what he said? I thought it was a Third Reich pudding that was... <laughs> <laughs> It's as good as the first two. <laughs> It'll last for a thousand years, yes. this rice. It's <laughs> no, he apologised for not sufficiently disassociating himself from inappropriate behaviour by other guests. Apparently, Aidan has a bit of um, form in the fancy dress area. In a series of photographs, Mr Burley is seen licking a woman's cheek while dressed as 80s children's television personality, <laughs> Timmy Mallet. <laughs> Where do you get those Timmy Mallet costumes <laughs> Well, that's, that's genuinely offensive, isn't it? Yes. I mean, Nazi uniform, yes, but Timmy. Timmy, man. <laughs> On the subject of traditional... Enim, enim, will you not talk when I'm... <laughs> They should be, those two should be separated. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, sir. It's not funny or clever. <laughs> You do that humming thing. Next time you're doing your link. Mm. <laughs> I need somebody to do that at um, jumble sales to get people out the way. You go, mmm, they'd look round and he'd be in. <laughs>
On the subject of traditional enemies, what have the French been saying about us? They said our economy is worse than theirs. Yes. Pretty rude. Um, Britain should be downgraded from AAA to whatever the smaller batteries are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, they're fantastically rude all round. The French finance minister said the economic situation in Britain is very worrying at the moment. You'd rather be French than British in economic terms. We don't want any lessons and we don't give any. Ooh, Louis Fair! <laughs> <laughs> the papers were quick to rush out a list of insults the French have thrown at us over the years. Any idea what the uh, French Prime Minister Edith Cresson said about the English in 1991? <laughs> Frankly, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? She said, one in four Englishmen is gay. Yes. <laughs> and not me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not an insult. I mean, that's fine. No, that's it? an that's underestimate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a jolly good thing. I, I spend half my life saying to my children, and that's a good thing. Whenever the word gay comes up, people say, you know, God, that's so gay. And that's a good thing. Mm. So there we are. It's a good thing. Good old Edith Cresson. Yeah, hurrah. Mm. Cresson, like croissant. <laughs> And that's a good thing. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that there's been a lot of news this year? Yeah, and you might have in your job. <laughs> These things can be quantified, apparently. Oh, really? According to the BBC News website, they ran this headline. Uh, 2011, the year when a lot happened. <laughs> so that's that, then. This is the... Um... <laughs> This is the heartwarming Christmassy news that the Grinch has avoided paying £25 billion in tax. An HMRC spokesman rejected the MP's damning report, saying it was based on partial information, inaccurate opinion and some misunderstanding of facts. A bit like my tax return. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fallout from David Cameron's European veto continued. The main stumbling block remains Cameron's desire to protect the city from the financial transaction tax. Surely the compromise would be to introduce it and then ask the HMRC to try and collect it. <laughs> and so to round two, the strengthometer of news. What I like to do at this time of year mm. is to decorate my newsometer. Yes, that's festive. Uh, and you might like to try this with your newsometers at home. <laughs> and just by dabbing some glue, quite easy. If, it's, if you have trouble with glue, ask your parents to help you. <laughs> put, some, put some glitter on it. And then, look, we blow that, and then all the glitter has just stuck to the glue, so there's no glue showing. And also, a little sprig of holly. That can make it look, <laughs> can make it look very seasonal, too. Uh, you might want to decorate the shaft of your mallet, too. <laughs> um, for expediency and for getting on with the show, I won't do that. Um, so, fingers on buzzers, Should you teams. put glue on the top, because you've got to hit it with a hammer? You worry about your oh, okay. job. Okay. <laughs> Merton. Right. Fingers on buzzers. Here's the first one. <laughs> Cut back. It's Snow White and the Five Dwarfs. <laughs> I think I read this. Did you? That's cheating. For your job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, children have, have been taking the parts of dwarves in pantos. Have they? Is that right? Yes. It's in Wolverhampton. Production Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. They've replaced them with child actors because they spent all the money on special effects. I don't know why that makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and a spokesman for the Wolverhampton Ground explained, money isn't limitless and dwarfs are very, very expensive. <laughs> I think the children have to put on dwarf masks, don't they? Mm -hmm. But their lines are pre-recorded by adult actors and played to the theatre on a loop while the young performers try their best to match their movements to the sound wreck. <laughs> What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Do you think it'll work? Yeah. <laughs> I, want to, I want to see it televised. If you're in any doubt, Jonathan Kiley, the director of the company behind the production, says it works quite well. <laughs> Peter Burroughs, who runs a dwarf acting agency, said it's not fair at all. It destroys the magic to have the voices pre-recorded. It's tradition to have dwarves <laughs> in this role. The clue's in the name. <laughs> And uh, I suppose, don't suppose you know how the theatre goers in Wolverhampton have responded to this. No, are they fed no. up? They're not, they're not great. One, one said, I could go to any amateur production and see children playing dwarfs. <laughs> Presumably that depends on what the production is. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of panto stars, um, why have the perennial favourites, the Crankies, been causing a stir this oh, week? Swingers. Yes. They were no. swingers. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. Yes. 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 That's what yes. Yes. said on the night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, the Sun was very quick to react to the public's thirst for more information. <laughs> Do you know what they did? 
Well, they didn't hack the cranky's phone, did they? <laughs> they, they put out an appeal. Have you had a hanky panky for the cranky? <laughs> According to the Mail, Jeanette Cranky had an affair with a circus leopard tamer, while uh, Ian Cranky carried on with the act's glamorous assistant. And um, any ideas how they could tell that this had happened? She came up in spots. Things were revealed <laughs> when uh, Jeanette noticed glitter from the assistant's leotard <laughs> on her husband's body. <laughs> Ian complained that his wife smelled of leopards. <laughs> Talking of celebrities in their private lives, this is probably the moment to pay the last weekly visit to the Leveson Inquiry. <laughs> this week's big gun was Piers Morgan, of ah. course. Here he is looking serious on the front page of The Independent on Wednesday. There's another photo just above him with someone looking like he's rather enjoying Piers'... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what Piers Morgan admitted to? No, I didn't watch it. No interest to me, him being sliced up by a QC in front of millions of people. <laughs> <laughs> the fact he made a fool of himself, I'm not going to watch that. That. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> On a loop right for now. hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the only thing he admitted to was having heard a voicemail message from Paul McCartney to Heather Mills, but he refused to say who played it to him or to accept that listening to the message um, was unethical. And there was a lot of him being showed things he'd said before, him trying to deny them now. I'm not saying he made a fool of himself. <laughs> and he did. I, I, <laughs> are you surprised that he had no knowledge of any phone hacking? It's extraordinary. He did what we call the full Murdoch. <laughs> no, he couldn't remember anything. Let's take a look at him on this programme back in May 1996, <laughs> discussing the use of photographers with Clive Anderson. The answer is tennis ball. Surely you must have covered that in the day. Yes, I'm not doing That's very well on these, page five story. What do you know about newspaper editing, Clark? <laughs> about as much as you do. <laughs> <laughs> dear, oh dear, Clark. So you no, plunge merrily no, deeper. I know it's not fair, because no. the mirror now is almost as good as the sun. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was rude to you, you sent photographers around to my doorstep the next day, so I'm not doing that again. No. You uh, won't see them this time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he is charming, isn't he? <laughs> Quite chilling, isn't it? Which one was me? <laughs> <laughs> funny, how you, funny how you forget things, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the pantomime which has disappointed the residents of Wolverhampton, which takes some doing. Uh, in <laughs> other panto publicity, the crankies revealed their swinging past. The Sun concluded their article by asking readers, have you had hanky-panky with the cranky? And gave them a phone number to call, not the news desk, just a helpline. Uh, meanwhile, the Leveson Inquiry heard from former Mirror editor Piers Morgan, who had said that he'd heard a voicemail in which Paul McCartney begged Heather Mills to come home after a row and sang We Can Work It Out, to which presumably she responded by ringing his answer machine and singing the Dire Straits classic Money for Nothing. <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Here's the next one. Oh. They've yes. discovered that not only has Francis Bacon written all Shakespeare's plays, but he's also played left back for the England team. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. This is news that uh, football was so dangerous in Tudor times it had to be banned. Is that news? Well, it's about 400 years old. It's isn't it? just emerged. <laughs> just emerged. It's, emerged. You've just it's, in. it's breaking. <laughs> Do you know how many people in England died playing football between 1500 and 1575? Yeah, 804. <laughs> Below. So. Uh, 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 four. <laughs> hundred and four. Seven. I can take direction. Seven. 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 They've just emerged from it, the Black Death yes. when a third of Europe died and they're worrying about football. Well, That's when an away leg was an away leg when you had to go to Europe. <laughs> Correctness <laughs> <gone>. <laughs> exactly. It may not sound a lot, but according to the Telegraph, yeah. only archery proved to be more dangerous <laughs> during the period. Uh, the mail reports of the seven footballers to die, two men were accidentally stabbed with a knife uh, <laughs> in the process of tackling an opponent, which led to the well-known phrase, he never touched him, ref. <laughs> uh, there was a tie for the third place in the list of the most dangerous Tudor activities. Any idea what that Marrying might? Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty dangerous. No, according to the Times, the third most dangerous activities were sword fighting, wrestling and bell ringing. 
John Langburn of Alliston had a particularly eventful game in 1523. Do you know what happened to him? <laughs> yeah, 1523. Come see, on. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Is that the one where his, his studs weren't quite long enough and he ended up, he broke a metatarsal and was out for two and a half weeks? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, now the coroner's record states that John Langburn of Alliston was playing football with Roger Bridkirk of Alliston, Labour and many others. They were running after a certain ball called the <laughs> photoball. Uh, no malice being between them, and both came to the ball at once and fell to the ground. <laughs> Roger fell on top of John and crushed his body by misfortune so that John immediately died. <laughs> uh, these aren't the earliest records of death by football. Do, do you know of any others? Is it inside the pyramids? Is there a wall fresco depicting a death by football? <laughs> was, was Stonehenge a football pitch with 16 different goals? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the Roman politician and lawyer Cicero describes oh, yeah. the case of a man who was killed whilst having a shave when a ball was kicked into a barber's shop. <laughs> yes, Can anybody guess what happened to Alexander Godby in 1542 as he sat on a churchyard wall watching archers shooting at targets next to the wall? <laughs> Go on. Uh, he got hit by a football. <laughs> <laughs> They warned him several times to get down, lest he get hit, but he would not. John Frisbee's arrow struck him on the left side of the head and he languished until 12th of June when he died. John Frisbee, of course, then uh, gave up archery. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that one. Um, this is the news that football used to be a violent game played by thugs. Between 1500 and 1575, seven men were killed in matches between English villages. According to the Mail, one man was accidentally stabbed with a knife in the process of tackling an opponent. His assailant was sent off, leaving his side to hang on to a 1-0 lead with only 136 men. <laughs> According to the Times, it was a man's game in those days. If a free kick was given, the defending town would literally make a wall. <laughs> <laughs> An academy at Southampton University has uncovered evidence that Henry VIII was a keen footballer. Very much the Ryan Giggs of his day, in that he slept with his brother's wife. <laughs> Fingers on buzzers' teams. Is it a virgin system where they're, they're, they're being very, this, this computer system is very, very strict about sort of what it considers rude words? So it's about simple, ordinary uh, words which aren't really cause much fuss being sort of censored by this, this computer thing. Is that right? Something like that? It's something just like that. Is yes, it? yes, yes. Have you any other was... amusing examples? Yes, I do. You know, I, think, <laughs> I think I can find some. Yes. Um, is Tom was... Thorpe in there by any chance? <laughs> um, wait for it. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> There's, a, there's an order to these things. Um, so, yes, the film Hancock was listed as yeah. this. Never mind the Buzzcocks became this. And slightly surprisingly, the golden age of canals was changed to... Uh... And which football club was Asterix in an unfortunate way? West Bromwich Albion. <laughs> was it Scunthorpe? Arsenal. Arsenal, which became... Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, AOL once um, banned people from Scunthorpe <laughs> and oh, Penniston <laughs> and Lightwater. It might take a little while over that one. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Everyone <Yeah>. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you know how the American Family Association upset 100-metre sprinter Tyson Gay recently, according to the Metro? They call him Tyson Unnatural Act or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, they just decided that the word gay should be replaced by homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, led to this headline being published, Homosexual eases into 100 metres <laughs> final at the Olympic trials. Which means, at the end of this round, it's Ian and Rebecca with three, and Paul and David with three. Oh, good. How exciting! <laughs> you are covered in glitter now. It's going to be all over your face. In fact, it is. It's all over your face. Is it all over my face? That'll be there for weeks now, won't it? Yes. What's the nature of glitter? The herpes of craft supplies. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> it's time now for the odd one out round. Ooh. And the four are George Osborne, <laughs> the Littlewoods Christmas TV advert, Mario Balotelli, and the Grinch. They all stole Christmas, except one of them. <laughs> Grinch stole Christmas, yeah. we know that. And Balotelli, I think, was there not a rumour of him giving away money? He gives money to people in the street. Oh, the Littlewoods TV ad this year has got in trouble because uh, they um, mentioned that Santa doesn't exist. Oh. <laughs> They've all tried to ruin Christmas. Is that it? Yes, apart from... Apart from Balotelli, who tried to make everyone's Christmas... By giving away money? You're absolutely right. Mario Balotelli um, yes. was the odd one out. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Uh, Mario Balotelli has been reportedly getting into the Christmas spirit by putting on a blue Santa hat and driving around Manchester handing out gifts and money at random. Any idea what sort of things he was handing out? Gifts, gifts and, money? and money at random. <laughs> 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 Do you find that at all? Uh, was it gold? Frankincense? <laughs> According to the Daily Star, he was giving out wads of cash up to £500 and somebody called House Party tweeted, just been handed a toasty maker by Mario Balotelli. <laughs> the guy's unbelievable, quite shocked. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, do you know how his, his boss, Ian, oh, this one for you, his boss, Roberto Mancini, reacted when he was asked about the story? He was pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he said, with Mario, anything is possible. Uh, just to remind you, this is the same guy that nearly burned his house down by letting a firework off from his bathroom window. And uh, he came back from a trip to buy cleaning stuff for his mother, followed by a lorry with a trampoline, a scale electrics, two Vespers and a table tennis set. <laughs> Roberto is less than pleased with Mario at the moment. He may fine him £150,000. Mm. Do you know why? Uh, oh, he... Oh, no, 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 that's the other one. The, uh... the other one? Are there only two footballers? <laughs> <laughs> that was me thinking, now hundreds I had to learn. <laughs> had to learn. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start this process of learning all about professional footballers? About ten years ago, did and you? I've got nowhere. Yeah. They, they keep, keep changing. changing don't they? they do, they're all <laughs> someone else. <laughs> <laughs> what he did, Ian, yes. <laughs> add this to your learning, was yeah. he broke the 48-hour pre-match curfew to go out for a curry where he was involved in a mock sword fight using rolling pins. <laughs> <laughs> he's great, isn't he? He sounds terrific. I think he sounds absolutely first rate. He's had quite an eventful time since he's been the UK resident. In 2010, just days after joining Manchester City, Balotelli crashed his car. According to the Mirror, when police asked him why he had £5,000 in his back pocket, he told them, because I am rich. <laughs> And a few weeks later, while sidelined by a knee injury, Balotelli and his brother were questioned by Italian police after driving into the grounds of a woman's prison, reportedly, to have a look around. <laughs> <laughs> George Osborne did spoil Christmas recently for many of his Cheshire constituents. What happened? Do you know? We don't really have George Osborne in Ireland. No. <laughs> well, what happened was hordes of teenage girls turned up to see One Direction hunk Harry Styles turn on the town's Christmas lights. Is that, that what was... a hunk looks like? Yeah, I know. They're, <laughs> they're getting smaller, aren't there. they? <laughs> um, unfortunately, that was just a rumour, and George Osborne turned up and turned them on instead. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Who else has ruined Christmas for someone this week? There's no way of you knowing. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Take us back to 1542. <laughs> we were happier then when there was just two TV channels. Um, it is this FedEx delivery man <laughs> dropping a computer off to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they've all been accused of ruining Christmas, apart from Mario Balotelli. Mario Balotelli dressed up as Santa and dished out handfuls of £20 notes to people in Manchester. It's the most cash given away in football circles since Qatar won the right to host the World Cup. <laughs> It had been rumoured that Nutsford's Christmas lights were to be turned on by <laughs> Harry from One Direction, but George Osborne turned up instead. It could be argued that the Chancellor is actually a better choice to turn on his constituency's lights. Mind you, it could also be argued that Harry from One Direction is a better choice to run the economy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Water, Sewerage and Waste. <laughs> the one part of the press that's proud to be in the gutter. <laughs> We start with what and what for every visitor at Water, Sewerage and Waste Exhibition. Fear and loathing. <laughs> Holoscope and free sample. <laughs> number one and number two. <laughs> <laughs> Might be 
free <laughs> shower and access to counselling. Yeah. <laughs> Tasty free hot buffet and ample free parking. <laughs> Welcoming guests to the buffet, the organiser got things off to an uncertain start by informing them there was no formal seating, but people could help themselves to a stool. <laughs> Next, what as butter crisis bites? Panic spreads. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't care what you think. <laughs> Bitter butter batter. No, you're not the same bit of butter batter. <laughs> Blatter bitter. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you. Go on in. Two held. The Telegraph reported a sudden rise in demand has created shortfall in Norway, leaving Norwegians facing Christmas without their seven traditional types of home cooked biscuits. <laughs> if you're watching in Ethiopia, I can only apologise. <laughs> Next. Penguin, what in the panda queue? Oh, it's throwing poo. The penguins got jealous at Glasgow Zoo of all the attention <laughs> the pandas were getting. So they started hurling droppings at the crowd. The, the spooky thing is they weren't penguin droppings. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, penguin droppings would surely be quite liquid. It'd be quite hard to hurl, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd just be kind of... Is it not like bird poo? They haven't really got hands, either, have they? <laughs> <laughs> this story doesn't hold together at all. Well, I suppose they could... Sounds they very little... fishy. Penguins are... <laughs> Penguins are famously jealous of other monochrome animals. <laughs> and they... It is. Poo hits fans. Uh, this is at Edinburgh Zoo, where the penguins keep jumping onto a wall and pooing on the panda visitors below. Uh, not only annoys the visitors, but also uh, David Attenborough's film crew, who'd been told they were in the Antarctic. <laughs> Next, what steers clear of Wales? Ireland. <laughs> Santa Nav, Santa Nav, Santa Christmas, Santa Christmas, Father Christmas, Santa Claus, Santa Nav. Yes, Santa Claus. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> Santa steers clear of Wales. Visits by Santa and his helpers to Welsh schools have been cancelled because he may not have been CRB checked. <laughs> so it'll be a miserable Christmas for school children in Wales, as usual. <laughs> Next, you may what, but never insult Gregor McGregor of McGregor. You may think his name is a bit repetitive. <laughs> you may be a dog of war, but never insult Gregor oh, McGregor Simon of McGregor. Simon Mann. Yes. Mm. Former mercenary Simon yeah. Mann has enraged the clan McGregor by insulting their late chief in his memoirs. Simon Mann describes Sir Gregor McGregor of McGregor as a toxic, red-haired, farting, foul-mouthed <laughs> dragon. Not to be confused with Rebecca Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Sludge Finder 2, what? Waste Disposal Unit 2. Score draw. An interesting film, but in the end it didn't really work. <laughs> Is it a robot that goes inside sewage pipes? Oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> you would get a robot to do that. They're very, they're, they're very bright. <laughs> We'd only do it once, wouldn't it? I'm not going in there again, it stinks. The Sludge Finder 2 yeah. allows optimization of sludge thickness and the production of consistent solids. I know how it feels. <laughs> This is from Water, Sewerage and Waste magazine, yeah. which has announced the location of the next exhibition as Birmingham, which is described as the obvious choice <laughs> for the sewage industry. <laughs> Bit of a blow for Middlesbrough there. <laughs> so, on that, the final scores are Ian and Rebecca have a massive eight, uh, whilst Paul and David have a rather silly four. <laughs> it's a Before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. After a criticism of Frozen Planet, Attenborough has music for a new series recorded on location. <laughs> <laughs> it's one the elephant saying to Joe, hang on, he's playing my brother's teeth. <laughs> Next. What time did the crankies get here? <laughs> and I leave you with news that in North Yorkshire there's a poor turnout for the cast reunion party for Last of the Summer Wine. In central London, after an alarmingly high reading, one patient is advised to retake the test with a male nurse. 
In Kensington Park, after a spate of dog fouling, local residents are called in to identify whether it's their dogs that are responsible. <laughs> At a G20 summit in Washington, the Obamas and President Medvedev welcomed Nicolas Sarkozy to the podium. And midway through a conference, George Osborne suddenly has the idea of charging tax on funerals. <laughs> and this tragedy for Santa's little helpers, after his loop-the-loop -loop sleigh manoeuvre, goes horribly wrong. <laughs> Good night. Stand to attention, David Jason is the Royal Bodyguard, brand new tomorrow at 9.30. And then anything goes with the outrageous Mrs Brown's Boys at 10. Boxing Day comedy on BBC One. My father is an older man, mm -hmm. and we, uh, he, he takes me out for lunch sometimes. And you know in restaurants you get handed this thing at the end for the credit card. Mm -hmm. My father has this joke that he loves doing, where when they hand this over, or they bring it to the table, he just looks at it for a second and he just goes, Hello? <laughs>